So we are in a series called Lego Faith. We're talking about building our faith one brick at a time. I did have Legos, but I must have put them down. So last week, hopefully you got a green brick signifying the idea of grow. Today, as you leave, as you walk out of the auditorium, you will get a red brick, which symbolizes supremacy. We were in two minds about which color to use for supremacy, because it's a sort of royal idea, a royal color, and often royalty is displayed by purple. Do you know how hard it is to get purple Lego bricks? <laughs> Ask Brooke. She will tell you in great detail, with great passion, how hard it is. To... So today, um, in the tradition of Queen Elizabeth, we are going to be celebrating royalty in red. And uh, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> Supremacy indicates the one who is above all. And obviously, as a Christian church, we believe that Christ is above all. And in the book of Colossians today, we're going to go further into chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 15 to 23. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, or a Bible app, then you can look it up. Otherwise, you can watch the screen, and it will appear behind me. So Colossians 1, 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy." For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation." If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So this passage starts by really dealing with the question, who is Christ? And there are three aspects of that that Paul outlines here. Christ and his relationship to God, Christ and his relationship to creation, and Christ and his relationship to the church. So let's start with the first one. And this is chock full of great theology with some amazing benefits at the end, which we'll get to. Uh, Christ and his relationship to God. He is the image of God. The Greek word used here is actually icon. Uh, and we're familiar with that word. It doesn't mean icon in the sense of something physical or material, but in terms of essence. So Christ is the very likeness or manifestation of the essence of God. And he is the firstborn from among the dead. Now, firstborn is a little bit of a tricky one to deal with because when we think of born, we think of someone that wasn't and then someone that was. And of course, that doesn't refer to Jesus, who as the second person of the Trinity always existed, um, even before the incarnation. But it has the meaning of either priority in time or supremacy in rank. He is before all things and over all things. In the ancient world, there was the custom that the firstborn would have extra rights and privileges, and this could refer to that. I'm actually the firstborn in my family. Are there any other firstborns here? Yeah, don't you think this should still be instituted, that we should get extra rights and privileges, like double inheritance? Sounds good to me. 20 pounds instead of 10. Um, so <laughs> then it moves on to Christ and his relationship to creation. He is the creator. Things were created by him and for him. It was done in and through Christ. He was the mediating agent and the end for which all things exist. The universe, the thrones, the powers, the rulers, the authorities. You get the sense here that Paul is becoming pretty inclusive. He's sort of saying, and everything else is subject to him. Some people believe that there was a heresy in Colossae that Paul was addressing, and the heresy could have involved the worship of angels. It's like touched by an angel, taken to the extreme. And they think that Paul might have been trying to dampen down the enthusiasm for angels and saying, however fantastic and wonderful you think angels are, remember, Christ is above even spectacular angels. And in Christ, 
the universe is sustained. In him, all things hold together. Christ is the unifying principle. It's interesting when you look at the history of science how the different physics have tried to explain the way the universe is structured. We had Newtonian physics and then Einsteinian physics and now quantum physics. Who knows what's coming next? But it seems like they're always trying to catch up with the amazing thing that God did and never quite grasping it. They changed their opinion about how it was done every 200 years or so. Then we move on to Christ and his relationship to the church. He is the head of the church. We are his body. Different denominations may have different heads of the church. The Catholics have the Pope. The Anglicans have the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, other denominations have different denominational leaders. But in essence, the head of the church, above all of these, is Christ himself. He is our sovereign king and leader. The church is a living organism, the means by which Christ carries out his purposes and performs his work. It's the hope of the world. And there is supposed to be a close and intimate union with Christ and his church. We are supposed to represent Christ. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those fairgrounds or on a, on a pier where they have those like big cardboard cutouts with the head area removed and you put your head in and you know sometimes it's like of a huge bodybuilder and you put your head in and the humor is in the great mismatch between your head and the muscular body. Obviously not a great mismatch in my case, but for many of you... <laughs> You haven't seen me without a shirt on. Um, but for many of you, for many of you, uh, no. So the, the, it's humorous, right? Because you sort of put your head in, and there's a tiny head, and then the huge muscular body, and the, the humor comes in the mismatch. It's a lot less funny when that is true of Christ and the church. When the, the head is one way, Christ, and the body, which is supposed to represent and go with that head, looks very different. And I think that's always the challenge for us as a church, the question we must ask ourselves when we look at Christ and how he lived, and we look at our lives and how we live, is there congruence there, or is there a horrible mismatch? Are we representing Christ adequately, or is there this uh, dissonance between who we are and who Christ is? He is the resurrected one, the firstborn from the dead. Some of you are thinking that there were other people that were resurrected before Christ. Some of you sharp, gospel-knowing people are thinking, well, hang on a second. There were other people that were resurrected before Jesus was resurrected, and this is true. But those people that were resurrected, like Lazarus, would also die again. <laughs> a bit of a downer for Lazarus. Like, again? Seriously? Can you, <laughs> can you imagine Lazarus at the end of his life? He's getting really ill, and he thinks, I'm about to die. He's like, oh, I've, really, I've done this once already. Do I really have to go through it again? Um, but Christ is the first one who is resurrected into true eternal life where he will never die again. Everyone else that he resurrected would die again. So he is the firstborn from the dead, never to die again. And he is supreme. He is the Lord of all. And to use the word supreme or supremacy here is almost redundant. And it's really a summary of all that has gone before. I know that my belief in the supremacy of Christ has given me great confidence in situations of spiritual warfare or where I faced very direct challenge to my faith. I remember one time when I was on a, a missions trip in Berlin, Germany, preaching in the central square called Breitscheidplatz, and we were told by some Christians in the area that a group of Satanists in the area wanted to disrupt our preaching. And so the Satanists came, all dressed in black, some of them with rats, you know, just the fashion accessory for a Satanist, I guess. Uh, and they came to try and disrupt our preaching. And one big guy, dressed all in black, came up right in front of me as I was preaching and held an upside-down cross right in front of me, thinking that that would intimidate me. And inside, I was like, who do you think you are, little Satanist? I mean, even the upside-down cross is a bit of a joke because it is rumored um, and probably historically accurate that the apostle Peter was crucified upside down. So you're holding the sign of Peter in front of me. Ooh. It's, just, it's just not going to... What is it, Halloween, an upside down cross? Um, and it's just, it's not scary to me when I know that Christ is supreme. And I think to myself how foolish the Satanists are when they think that this is their access to real power, dark power. If they wanted real power, then they need to get to know Jesus. And I was not intimidated. I just carried on preaching, uh, sort of smiling inside. And eventually, he just sort of put down his cross and ran away. And I was like, that's right, you run away. Jesus is Lord. And, and in ever, I, whenever I face those type of situations, and sometimes there are people who are struggling with issues of you know, demonic oppression or things like that, 
I'm always confident that Jesus is bigger than that, that we do not need to be afraid. There is nothing that Jesus is scared of. And therefore, if Christ is in me and I am in him, then there's nothing I need be scared of in the spiritual realm. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In the book of James, it talks about the demons know that Christ is Lord and they tremble at the fact. If you want something scary, Jesus is where you go, scary to the dark forces. And I, I'm always just so thankful that I have confidence in that. So that if I'm in these situations where spiritual attack or spiritual warfare is happening, I do not need to be afraid because Christ is supreme. It, it, it's always an interesting idea of how Christ and the devil are portrayed in popular literature or in movies as though they're equal and opposite. Nonsense. You know, the devil is not the opposite of God. He's opposite in intention, but he's not opposite in any other way because the devil is a created being. He was an angel who went bad. He's the opposite, if you like, of the archangel Michael, but he's not the opposite of God, and we need not be afraid of him. Jesus is the full expression of God. For many of us, it, it's hard to picture God. He's so beyond our imagining, so utterly other, that we find it hard to conceptualize what he's actually like. But in Jesus, we find a God that is tangible, a God with flesh on, a God that we can actually relate to. And my question to you this morning is, do you know him? Do you know this God? Turn your attention to the screen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod 
couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Come on. You know, it's always a tactical error for a white man to follow a black preacher, but that was, that was just too good to ignore. I mean, it's about Christ. It's got blocks in it. I mean, how perfect was that? Ah, what has Christ done? Through him, God has reconciled all things to himself, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. For things to be reconciled, there's a presumption that there must have been a breach in the relationship, and so it was. God created human beings in order to share his love and his life with them. But as part of that creation, he allowed us the possibility of free will so that we could choose to not love. If love had been forced, then it would not have been real love. It would have been coercion or we would have been robotic in our response to God. So God created the option that we could choose to not love. And we exercised that option. And the seed of rebellion was sown in our spiritual forefather and mother of Adam and Eve and has infected every one of us since then. The pure and holy God encounters sinful human beings. The relationship is broken, and we know what that's like. For those of us that are married, there may have been hypothetically times in our marriage where there was disagreement between us and our spouse, and it felt like there was a wall between us. There was a coldness in the relationship. Or even with close friendships, you know, if you're out of sorts with another person, just how distant you can feel and how bereft. And that is how it was with us and God, a growing cold in the relationship. And the question always is, who will take the first step? Who will take the first step to reconcile? Who will humble themselves and take the first step to reconcile? God wasn't just sympathetic to our plight. He actually did something about it. That something was Jesus. And to understand why the incarnation was necessary, I'd like to read a short story, which is most often read at Christmas, but relates perfectly here. Now, the man to whom I'm going to introduce you was not a Scrooge. He was a kind, decent, mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men. But he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. I'm truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite and that he'd much rather stay at home, but that he would wait up for them. And so he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier and then went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, then another and then another, sort of a thump or a thud. At first he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against his living room window. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They'd been caught in the storm and in a desperate search for shelter had tried to fly through his large landscape window. Well, he couldn't let the poor creatures lie there and freeze, so he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter if he could direct the birds to it. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes and tramped through the deepening snow to the barn. He opened the doors wide and turned on a light, but the birds did not come in. He figured food would entice them in, so he hurried back to the house, fetched breadcrumbs, and sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs and continued to flap around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around, waving his arms. Instead, they scattered in every direction except the warm-lighted barn. And then he realized that they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I am a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Because any move he make tended to frighten and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. If only I could be a bird, he thought to himself, and mingle with them and speak their language, then I could tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them so they could see and hear and understand. 
At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind. And as he stood there listening to the bells, listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas, he sank to his knees in the snow. He got it. In Christ, God becomes tangible. God becomes relatable. God becomes knowable. That is what God did in Christ Jesus. In the last part of this passage, we really have an interesting before and after image presented. Before, he says, you were alienated and enemies of God. In the book of Romans, Paul actually calls us God-haters, which is strong language. But if someone goes that far to express their love to you and you ignore it, that can very well be perceived as hate. And we do go our own way. I spoke to a Christian parent just this last week who was so devastated about the fact that their child is no longer walking with the Lord and is making some very painful life choices and getting themselves into trouble. And this father's heart was breaking for the waywardness of his daughter. And I think that's something of how God must feel when he has given everything that we might know him, that we might know life and choose a good path, and instead we, we wander off into places that do not do us good, but only do us harm. And we leave the God who loves us, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And that's our experience. We wander away. But now you are reconciled, holy, without blemish, free from accusation. It's an incredible transformation from the before part to the after part. There's a verse in the book of Jude, which is probably my favorite in the whole Bible. It says this, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, hear this, without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. I think that's a little bit hard for us to imagine, those of us that have been made very conscious of our sin, that we will be presented without fault and with great joy. I mean, that's, that's doubly good news, that we're presented when we come before God, our sins are washed away. We are not held accountable for our sins anymore. As the great book of judgment is being opened up, Jesus steps forward and says, it's okay. He's one of mine, or she's one of mine. And not only presented without fault, sort of grudgingly in, oh, okay, you're one of his, go on then. But, but with great joy. It's almost as if we arrive in heaven and Jesus goes, ta-da, look at what I made. Look at what I, did you see what he was like before? Yeah, you'd clap too. Look at what I made. And it's with great joy that we are ushered into the presence of God. You, you know, those of you that are parents will relate to this. If your child does something that makes you proud, you're like, yes. I mean, I watched my daughter Cicely the other day catching a ball. And she was like catching balls all over the place. I was like, that is my daughter. You know, she has, she has the glean coordination. Um, and I was just so proud of my daughter. And to imagine that God would feel something of that pride, something of that delight in us, us sinful, flawed human beings who he no longer sees that way, it's a beautiful thing. Someone once said, if God had a fridge, your picture would be on it. Because that's the love. It wasn't original to me. Um, But that's the love that God has for us. So continue in your faith and the hope of the gospel. Persevere. Don't give up. Failures are not fatal, and you are not disqualified. I want to close this message with one more video, and then I'll just make a couple of closing comments. This is the truth. If you turn things upside down, you can't hope for your life to change. I would be lying to you if I said that you have a great future ahead, that you can recover from your past mistakes, that your life could be filled with joy, that your children could be safe and healthy. More than anything, you must know, human beings cannot accomplish these things. And I'm convinced of this because I know you. All you are capable of is failure. 
you have made a complete mess of your life and I refuse to believe under any circumstances that you can turn things around in the coming years. You may think your life is bad now, but there's more to come. You have only one destiny, and whether you like it or not, this is what is real. I am the Lord your God. You should know I believe exactly the opposite. I am the Lord your God. This is what is real. And whether you like it or not, you have only one destiny. There's more to come. You may think your life is bad now, but you can turn things around in the coming years. I refuse to believe under any circumstances that you have made a complete mess of your life and all you are capable of is failure. And I'm convinced of this because I know you. Human beings cannot accomplish these things. More than anything, you must know that your children could be safe and healthy, that your life could be filled with joy, that you can recover from your past mistakes, you have a great future ahead. I would be lying to you if I said that you can't hope for your life to change. If you turn things upside down, this is the truth. I think when we understand the supremacy of Christ, we understand that Christ is bigger than our sin and our shame, that Christ is bigger than our faults and our failures, that Christ is bigger than our stains and our sadness, that Christ is Lord and he is supreme. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning and we declare with, with full hearts and with great joy that you are Lord, you are supreme, you are above everything in creation, that everything was made by you and for you. And those of us that know you, we delight to be your children. We thank you that you have transformed our lives, that we are now reconciled, that there is no breach in relationship between us and God because you took care of that on the cross, that we are holy, that we are without blemish, that we can be presented without fault and with great joy. And Lord, some of us find that hard to believe. We, we've led lives, things have been done to us, and we've done things, uh, and we find that hard to believe. But in faith, we grasp hold of that this morning, and we thank you for your supremacy. In Jesus' name, amen.